Welcome back to Split the Party. Once again, I'm your host, Steve Osmond, and today we're here to talk about a game I really, truly love, uh, the Pathfinder Adventure Card Game. I can't say enough good things about this game. Uh, it is, I originally picked it up because I am a huge deck building fan, and I was surprised to find out that this is not a deck building game. There are similarities, um, but it's not really a deck building game. It truly feels like role playing with cards. It, you feel, you get the feeling of assembling a role playing party and going on this adventure and taking, you know, going on these missions together. Uh, when you start with your character, you know, you'll pick whoever it is that you want to play. For instance, I've got Kira the Cleric here. Uh, you're, it's going to tell you what you use to assemble your deck. Everyone has exactly the same number of cards in their starting deck, which is important because your deck is also your hit points. When you have cleared out your deck, you're dead and have to start over at first level. Um, but it'll tell you how many weapons, spells, armor, item, allies, and blessings to place in your deck. And you use uh, basic items for that. They'll have in the top left corner all the keywords, and one of them has to be basic for you to be able to assemble your deck with them. On the other side of your card, it'll have some special abilities at the bottom. And then at the top, it'll have all of your attributes and the skills that your character has that pertain to them and kind of give you an idea of how good you are at these things. For instance, Kira, being a cleric is not awful at melee. She has a d6, not a d4 in strength. Um, and she has a plus two when she's actually using melee, as she's actually hitting things as opposed to just trying to be strong. Um, the dice go from d4 to a d12 with uh, just the, the newest set using a d20. So a d6 is not awful, but it's pretty low on the spectrum. However, her wisdom, again, being a cleric, that's a d12. That's right at the top. And if she's using divine magic, she adds an extra plus two, so she's going to be a d12 plus two. You're going to try and place her in situations where she's going to be using her wisdom because that is her strength. Well, how do you place people in those situations? You've got a number of locations. Whatever adventure you're on will tell you which locations to use, and each one of those locations also has a deck list. Use this many of the same items that you use for the characters, but then you also add in monsters and barriers. Before you fin finalize the deck, you're going to take the villain for the scenario and all of his henchmen, shuffle them together, and place one of them blindly into each of the location decks and shuffle those up. So you know the villain is out there, and you know that the rest of the locations have one of his henchmen at them. Every time you find a henchman and defeat him, you can attempt to close the location. Closing the location means it is no longer a viable place for the villain to go and hide because when you find the villain and defeat him, if there are locations that are still open, he will run there. He will go to one of the random locations that are still open. You'll take blessings from the box and the villain equal to the number of locations, shuffle them up, and place them all blindly in there. So not only are you adding the villain to it, but you're also adding more cards that you need to dig through to figure out where he's at. That is also a problem because you're playing this game on a timer. Regardless of your player count, whether it be two or five, you have 30 total player turns that can be taken. You flip over a card at the beginning of each player's turn, and when 30 cards in that Blessings deck have been flipped over, the game is over, you lose. Uh, so you, you know, the more players you've got, it actually starts to feel a little bit more hectic. You're, even though you have more skills to apply to everything, you're also running against the clock a little harder. So you don't want the villain to be disappearing into these locations because every time he does, he's also adding blessings. He's adding more turns that you're having to take to dig through all of these things to find him and defeat him. Um, each of the characters will have uh, three different basic blocks on them. There's the skills block the powers block, and the card block. When you complete an adventure, some of the adventures will give you an item. It will say, for instance, draw a random weapon from the box and add that to your loot. <clears throat> the loot is all of the things that you and your party have found that aren't monsters or barriers, all of the goodies that you found while you were on your adventure. You throw them in at the end of the game, and everybody kind of goes through and picks out what works best for their character and replaces cards. You don't add them to your deck, you replace cards in your deck with those cards. For instance, maybe I had a dagger and we found a plus one dagger. Well, I'm going to take that because not only is it magical, which may help out, but it's going to give me a little bit more damage, make it a little easier for me to hit. So I'm going to take that plus one dagger and take out 
the original, the plain dagger, and put that back in the box. So with the adventures, some of them will tell you, like I said, for instance, pick out a random weapon, add that to the box. Everybody's going to do that, or add that to the loot. Some of them will tell you, gain a power feat, or gain a card feat, or a skill feat. The feats are the little white boxes that are empty in here. You can start uh, by filling them in whichever ones you want, starting from the left and then moving over. For instance, if I wanted to make my wisdom even better, I could fill in the plus one box here. So now I'm going to have wisdom of D12 plus one. And then next time I got a power, I got a skill feat if I wanted to, I could fill in the plus two, or I could put it on something else. So your character is actually developing. The nice thing about that is next time I play, my character's a little bit better than last time. I have a different deck because I've gained some cards. Maybe I've gained a feat or two, and so my character is slightly more evolved here and has developed. He's ba essentially leveled up like you do in the tabletop role-playing game. And so I'm, you're playing this same character, but you start, as you're developing, picking out, like, these are the things that I'm going to start putting in my deck. This is how I'm going to be building my guy. This is the evolution of my character. So it really does have that feeling of playing a tabletop role-playing game, but playing it with the cards. Uh, it's incredibly well-designed. Paizo has done a fantastic job with this. I think everyone should give it a chance. If you like deck-building games, there, there is the essence of that in here. You can feel the, the sort of DNA of a deck-building game in what they've created here. If you like role-playing games, this is a fantastic uh, a shorter term replacement for that. Maybe you don't have as much time as you would like to have a full role-playing session. You can sit down. We had a weekly game of this going for quite a while where we would sit down and play an adventure. And if we had enough time, if maybe we burned through that one real quick, we'll play another one. Uh, but we just sat down once a week and it didn't take nearly as much time as an actual tabletop role-playing session. Um, it, I really think that people should give this game a shot. If your friends have it, you should go over and tell them that you guys need to play it. It is worth checking out. Uh, but that's all I've got for today. I would like to thank our sponsors, Sound G Entertainment, Excelsior Games and Designs, and Duo Bus Design. Excelsior Games and Comics, and Duo Bus Design. I'll see you in the Nerdverse.